Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to present tonight. And thank you all out there for tuning in. I am really excited to share this research with you. Um, let me go ahead and pull up my presentation. Here we go. So tonight we're going to be reviewing the dishes, but uh, before I launch into that, um, I'd like to share a note about uh, the nature of the data sources and the visuals in this presentation. So this portion of my work is based on work with archival images and data from uh, whole ceramic vessels. And the vast majority of those were recovered uh, from mortuary contexts in the course of previous excavations. So out of respect for and sensitivity to uh, that, I will not in this presentation be showing any photographs or detailed sketches of any archaeological vessels. I will only be showing flat outlines or silhouettes of archaeological vessels. So any whole pots you see in photographs are replicas that I've made in the course of my research. Uh, and that includes the one in the title slide and in the promotional materials for this talk. So um, this is intended for general audiences. So let's jump in. Why dishes? This is not an analytical or archeological term, uh, but I'm using the term dishes in my title here because I'd like to gently nudge or jostle us a little bit out of some of our habitual ways of thinking about archaeological ceramics and do that in a way that can make it easier to see what some of those habitual ways of thinking and doing are and what impacts they have. And the term dishes also helps me to ground my thinking about ceramics in the fact that these were useful things in the hands and homes of Phoenix Basin residents in the past. Uh, even though as an archeologist, my encounters with them often take place within quite an abstract analytical frame. Uh, so the research present I'm presenting today is quite analytical um, and is centered on mathematical characterization and analysis of vessel shapes. Uh, my goals for this presentation are kind of twofold. Uh, first, I'd like to explore with you and build a more holistic view of Phoenix Basin Hoacom ceramic assemblages and the place of Salado polychrome ceramics within them. But I'd also like to examine a little bit uh, how standard archaeological ways of observing, recording, analyzing, and communicating uh, can impact our understandings of the past and of the material record, uh, sometimes in unintended ways. <laughs> um, so since I am talking today about how Salado polychrome ceramics are incorporated into Phoenix Basin ceramic assemblages, I'm going to start with a very extremely brief overview of the Salado phenomenon. Uh, so Broadly speaking, around 1300 CE, a suite of pottery types collectively referred to as Salado polychromes, or you'll see them called Roosevelt Redwares, spread rapidly across a broad swath of the United States Southwest, uh, encompassing portions of uh, what archaeologists have called the traditional Hoacom, Mogollon, and Ancestral Pueblo culture areas. This rapid spread and continued production and use of this pottery across the region until around 1450 CE created a material culture pattern that archaeologists have called the Salado phenomenon. Now, archaeologists have been interested in the Salado phenomenon for about a century, and there's a lot that's been published on the topic, uh, but I'm going to touch on just two major developments, um, beginning with Patricia Crown's study of Salado polychrome ceramics published in 1994, this uh, Ceramics and Ideology Salado Polychrome Pottery book. Crown's study was a foundational contribution to the study of Salado ceramics and the Salado phenomenon as a regional phenomenon. Her research established that Salado pottery was made in multiple locations throughout the region, and that it was used in a wide variety of everyday tasks. 
And in her broad regional perspective on this, she found that variability in the attributes of Salado polychromes did not parse out neatly into geographic or temporal patterns. So there's obviously, this is a complicated kind of thing. Um, Crown also argued that Salado polychrome pottery was related to a set of shared religious ideas, which is a, a strain of thought that continues. Uh, today. So a lot of other research on Salado has happened since the mid 1990s, uh, including the development of finer grained chronologies and the identification of subtypes or late variants of Salado polychromes. And an overall pattern has emerged that links the origin and spread of Salado to Cayenta migrations out of northeast Arizona to the south, um, after which a new inclusive religious, social, political ideology develops alongside this pottery tradition. And then these both spread widely across uh, the region and are maintained uh, through lasting connections among migrants and their descendants. And Archaeology Southwest, I just want to give them a shout out. I have a picture of one of their magazine covers up here. They've published a lot of great discussions of this research and very accessible discussions, especially focused on areas of southeastern Arizona, southwestern New Mexico. Uh, and then there's also uh, discussions about Phoenix um, and the Phoenix underground issue. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that this is the, the most prominent big picture narrative right now about the Salado phenomenon and its its origins and spread. Um, but what's happening over in Phoenix? The Phoenix Basin is a place of deep continuous history for Ho'okam, Hu'ugam communities, and it's not a place where Salado pottery originated. It would have arrived here sometime after its development uh, during that post 1300 CE spread across the region. Uh, with Phoenix being at the western edge of that regional distribution. Phoenix Basin sites lack immigrant enclaves of the kind seen elsewhere, and there are a number of different patterns that suggest that a different set of relationships was shaping the character of Salado things uh, in Phoenix as compared to other parts of the region. If you look to the published literature, Provenance and material characterization studies of Salado ceramics in the Phoenix Basin have generally been pretty small, uh, and the results have been largely inconclusive and sometimes even contradictory. So we do not yet have a really solid basis for understanding whether Salado polychrome pottery was made in the Phoenix Basin or elsewhere, though it was almost certainly produced in the Phoenix Basin, uh, or how many different production locales there were. This remains uncertain. Uh, and then how the production and distribution of Salado pottery uh, in or to the Phoenix Basin might have changed through time. Uh, but stay tuned for the rest of my dissertation research because I'm working on uh, several of these aspects. And I also know that I am not alone in my interest in these topics. So you'll probably see uh, more research on this coming out in the future. Uh, at Phoenix Basin sites, Salado polychromes make up only up to 2% of the ceramic assemblage in general. So the vast majority of what's going on here in terms of ceramics is not Salado polychrome. And this is also pretty different from some other parts of the region where Salado polychromes are far more frequent in ceramic assemblages. But even though there's only a little bit here, it shows up in all kinds of contexts and all kinds of sites during the late classic period. So it has a small but notable presence that is quite intriguing. Back in the misty dawn of my doctoral work, um, as I set out to study Salado polychromes in the Phoenix Basin, I read everything I could get my hands on about Salado and everything I could get my hands on about Salado in the Phoenix Basin. And a persistent question kept coming up in my mind. How did the Salado polychrome ceramics, this like up to 2%, fit in among all of the other Hoacom ceramics? So like, metaphorically, if I were to open up the kitchen cabinets in a Hoacom community and look at all the pots and pans and bowls and jars, uh, which pots are the Salado pots? Could they have been used interchangeably with plain wares and red wares? 
or do they only show up in unique forms without any parallel in the rest of the assemblage? Um, this sounded to me like the kind of pattern that someone must have written about in the 1930s, and I just, you know, haven't read the right book or hadn't found the right report. So I went to Dave Abbott, who's one of my dissertation committee co-chairs, and I asked him about this. And while I was sitting there in his office, expecting him to point out to me the book that I should read or um, give me a citation for the report to look for, uh, he just sat back in his chair and he looked at me and he said, nobody's asked that question before. So, okay, <laughs> I started to think about how I might go about answering this. And I went back to the published literature with this question in mind to see what, uh, what clues I could get. So I started out by asking how or how come ceramic assemblages organized, especially in terms of vessel forms, and then how do a lot of polychrome ceramics fit into or alongside that pattern? And it might sound like a relatively simple question, but this is where we run into the first of our challenges. Uh, I am far, far, far from the first person to think about vessel forms in Phoenix Basin ceramics. However, different researchers working in the Phoenix Basin have used different criteria for identifying and categorizing different vessel forms. So for example, Patricia Crown in her study uh, working with whole or reconstructable vessels defined bowls as being wider than they are tall and jars as being taller than they are wide. And this works okay if you have the whole thing, um, but it doesn't work very well if you just have a broken fragment. Uh, Abbott and others uh, defined forms lacking restriction at the orifice as bowls. And this is the figure from that, from that report. So you can see the unrestricted vessels at the top. And then they defined forms with restricted orifices as jars. And one of the benefits of this classification scheme is that you can use this on rim sherds as well as whole vessels and apply it to a, a wider range of, of objects. But during the Hohokam Classic period, a new wide mouth jar form appears in plain and red wares, uh, which closely resembles a form that other researchers would call a recurved rim bowl and it's a form that's common in salado polychromes and some other wares. Uh, similarly, vessels placed in the necklace jar category are often referred to as incurved rim bowls by other researchers. Um, and then for a final example of these challenges, uh, Emil Howery, writing in 1945, observed these unusual long neck salado bottle forms that have small openings, and long necks. Um, he observed these at the site of Los Muertos, described them, but then chose to lump them into a broader jar category rather than report them separately. So given this situation overall, you might open a book or a report or look at a table of this many bowls and this many jars, but that table doesn't tell you what classification criteria were used to construct it. And it also doesn't tell us how much variability is encompassed by the single term bowl or the single term jar. Does jar include bottles or not? Is that a separate category or is that included here? Um, given this, it quickly becomes very difficult to make sense of these patterns across a range of studies and to really understand the variability in Hohokam vessel shapes or the structure of the overall ceramic assemblage. So even though it's difficult to compare across different projects, some interesting patterns have emerged from previous work. Um, work by Abbott and others in the Phoenix Basin has suggested that ceramic assemblages of stable functional ranges may have persisted through time while particular roles within those assemblages have been taken up in turn by equivalent vessels of different wares and types. And the involvement of salado polychrome vessels in this overall pattern has been suggested, but it hasn't really been investigated. So today I'm going to share with you, explore with you uh, some of the first steps toward these investigations. And 
were to do this, I'm going to look at uh, vessel profile collections from archives uh, from Pueblo Grande and Las Colinas, so two very prominent, very big, very important uh, Hoacom village sites here along the Lower Salt River Valley in Arizona. So scale profile drawings of whole and reconstructable ceramic vessels were routinely made during many archaeological projects in the Phoenix Basin in recent decades. And this is fantastic because this creates a really valuable archive of ceramic vessel shape data. Um, the first set of profiles I'm going to examine here were collected as part of the Pueblo Grande whole vessel study. Uh, this study examined 2,034 whole and reconstructable vessels recovered from Pueblo Grande during large-scale excavations conducted in the early 1990s. 91% of these vessels were recovered from mortuary contexts, and those original objects have long since been repatriated, uh, which precludes any additional analysis of the original objects. Uh, so we're really at, at the whim of <laughs> uh, whatever was recorded because we have no, no more access to the actual objects, which is actually a good thing. Um, though this data set uh, being predominantly mortuary, uh, so th though this data set is biased toward mortuary context and may not represent the complete range of ceramic forms present at the site, it still offers the best possible opportunity for a systematic examination of vessel shapes and associated data. Also, vessels recovered from mortuary contexts at Pueblo Grande exhibited a wide range of use wear patterns from day-to-day -day activities, and there isn't any evidence that ceramic vessels were produced specifically for mortuary use. So we have a good sense that the things that ended up in these contexts had been used in daily life even if it's not a complete representative set. Uh, this study collected information on 47 different variables uh, for each of the vessels in the study, including metric data, observations on temper, slip, surface treatment, use wear, so many things. It is a really, really tremendous data set. Um, but amazing as it may be, uh, working with archival data can also be challenging and there's often a good deal of the archaeology of archaeology to be done before you can begin your own work in earnest. So uh, sometimes this looks like me pouring over open folders and reports on the table and muttering to myself, now what exactly did they do? And what does this code mean? Um, sort of deconstructing what were the priorities and what were the methods um, that were at play in the minds of and, and in the activities of the people doing the original study that I'm now looking at the records they left behind. Um, so without the possibility of access to the original object, we are at the mercy of our analytical predecessors when it comes to the quality and the completeness of profiles and associated data sets. Uh, for the Pueblo Grande profiles, it was the nature of the profile drawings themselves that presented a considerable challenge because we were not able to extract these uh, silhouette outline shapes automatically, but we had to manually digitize them, um, which we did using Inkscape. Um, so every single one of these is a couple minutes of human work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. Um, and the we, the we that I'm using here includes a number of really wonderful undergraduate research apprenticeship students uh, who worked with me over the course of the past two years. And a uh, shout out and hello to you if you're watching. Uh, so once all of these vessel shapes have been digitized, we export plain black and white silhouette images. And these become the initial input for the shape analysis. And the method I'm using for the shape analysis, for the shape characterization, is called elliptical Fourier analysis, which is often abbreviated EFA. And the important and interesting thing to know about this method is that it allows the mathematical characterization of the whole continuous outline shape. Uh, it's also good at characterizing shapes with curved edges, uh, so it's well suited to pottery, because potteries often a bunch of curved surfaces. Um, so with the whole shape being characterized and, and 
mathematically summarized. We don't have to rely on vessel form categories or labels that have been assigned by analysts. We can go straight to the shapes themselves. We can characterize them. We can display them, compare them, and examine their relationships in a number of ways. One of the first things we can do, and it's actually kind of an image that's relatively common in uh, published reports is a figure or panel of vessel form, vessel profile shapes all displayed next to one another. So um, on the left here, we have digitized 469 vessels from the Pueblo Grande hole vessel study, including bowls, jars, scoops, jugs, wide mouth jars, and necklace jars. And here they are color coded by their form category designation by bowl, jar, scoop, et cetera. On the right, we have a set of 170 profiles from Las Colinas color coded by where. Um, so unfortunately, where is the only other information we currently have for these particular vessels, uh, but it's something. And uh, maybe someday we'll find some more information about these particular vessels. Um, as we can access other things in the archive for that excavation. Um, in any case, it is interesting to look at these all side by side. Um, and you can take in a certain amount of the variability at a glance, but it can be difficult to draw broader conclusions about vessel shapes and their variability and relationships among them from this kind of just side by side display. So another thing that we can do is to look at a stack of a set of scaled vessel outlines. Uh, so in this case, we've got vessel outlines belonging to a particular form category from that Pueblo Grande whole vessel study classification scheme. Um, and they're just scaled, centered, stacked up. Uh, and so here at a glance within a category, we can see uh, how much variability is included there. And sort of the, the broader and scribblier those lines look, the more variability there is within that category. But in, like in bowls, for instance, you can see that a lot of those that was forming a pretty dark line. Uh, so there's a, a tendency in the shapes there to be uh, of a certain kind, though there's also variability around that. Um, so this is nice kind of impressionistically to take in um, some patterns at a glance, but it would be nice to look more systematically at these and at the relationships between them. So to do that, what we're going to do is take the mathematically characterized shape information for each vessel, and we're going to summarize it as a dot displayed on what's called a morpho space or shape space. So while the dots are going to be placed precisely in a location that represents its vessel shape, uh, you can use these images in the background to kind of uh, get a sense of, of what kind of vessel shape you're actually looking at. Um, vessels with similar shapes are going to plot close to one another in a plot like this, and vessels with very different shapes should plot further apart. So if Poecom ceramic assemblages consisted of tightly bounded, discrete categories of vessel forms, then we would expect to see separate clusters of points on this plot. Maybe a plot, a little cluster of bowls, and then over someplace else, a cluster of jars, and someplace else, a cluster of scoops, and maybe some space in between these. But we already know that there is a bit of potential confusion around the boundary between what's a bowl and what's a jar. Um, so what happens when we plot all of our profile shapes from Pueblo Grande in the Morpho space? Ta-da, look at all those dots. It's very exciting, there's so many dots. Uh, so we definitely don't see discrete separating clusters here, uh, but instead we have this continuous spray of points across the shape space uh, with a tighter cluster over on the right side of the plot in shapes that look like bowl, bowlish things. And then a lot more diversity on, you know, going off to the left side of the plot into the jar territory. So the next question is, how do those shape category labels map onto this underlying structure of relationships between the shapes? So let's 
let's have a look at that. So here we have the categories jar, jug or pitcher, so a handled, uh, a jar, basically a jar with a handle, wide mouth jars or a uh, recurve rim bowl, if you like that term, a necklace jar, bowl and scoop all displayed here in different colors and bounded by different colored polygons. The first thing I notice when I look at this plot is the degree to which these categories overlap one another. Uh, so while bowls and jars, so jars in this orange on the left and bowls in the darker green on the right are separate, those two categories don't overlap. Um, the wide mouth jar and the necklace jar categories in pink and purple overlap almost completely and they definitely occupy this expectedly ambiguous space that's sitting between the bowl and jar categories. Um, and it's, I think, also notable that bowls and scoops overlap quite a bit off on the right side of the plot. So my primary takeaway from this is that if ho-com vessel category, vessel form categories seem a little ambiguous, it's probably because they are. Uh, what we see is a lot more continuity and even overlap than separation in vessel shapes in ho-com assemblages. And in considering the, uh, you know, taking, taking this information and looking critically at that classification scheme, uh, what's good about this classification scheme is its reproducibility. You can pretty reliably, whether you have a rim shirt or a whole vessel, reliably, and um, if you had several different analysts that you were training to do this, they could uh, reliably assign these correctly to one of these form categories. So it's it's replicable um, and, and internally consistent. However, um, understanding this underlying uh, set of relationships in the shapes is something to really keep in mind uh, to help us understand what we're looking at uh, when we're looking through the lens of these category labels. So as we go back and approach the literature, go read an old report or something that uses a framework like this, uh, we can look at those tables, we can read those discussions of how many bowls and how many jars, and we can bring to that um, this background knowledge uh, of understanding that there's a lot more continuous variability in here than um, the sorts of separation that sometimes categorical labels uh, imply. So here we have Las Colinas. What happens when we compare the Pueblo Grande vessels and the Las Colinas vessels? Ta -da. So you've got Pueblo Grande, now all of the different form categories are just represented as green dots and the whole batch of them is bounded by a green polygon and Las Colinas is here in orange. Uh, so these two different assemblage sets of profiles really occupy the same overall area of the shape space, and they have a pretty similar overall pattern with this sort of spray across the shape space in an arc and this slightly tighter cluster on the right near the bowl neighborhood and, and more spread out on the jar side of things. Um, but it's also interesting to notice that the bowls and scoops on the right side from the Las Colinas collection, they tend to be a little roundier than the ones from Pueblo Grande. So they sort of pull up and separate away a little bit from the uh, Pueblo Grande bowls and scoops, which is just something to tuck away maybe for a future, <laughs> future investigation. All right. Caitlin, that's great, but uh, how do the polychromes fit in? Which ones are the Salado polychromes? Well, joke's on us, because there aren't any vessel profiles of Salado polychromes from either of these sites' uh, archives. Uh, but it would be a really dirty trick for me to not show you any polychromes. But first, <laughs> I'm going to talk about some of my observations that this brings up about standard practices in archaeology. So archaeologists tend to think about decorated ceramics and undecorated ceramics in very different ways, uh, in that they're good for different kinds of analyses and they offer different kinds of information. And so they get 
thought about and documented very differently. In fact, the first step in a lot of ceramic analyses is to sort the decorated ceramics from the undecorated ceramics. And then from there, they go off on separate analytical journeys and are often even reported in separate chapters of reports. And they're not always brought back together in the end to kind of form that holistic picture of the ceramic assemblage. Um, and so I think about this, you know, if I were to open up my kitchen cabinets and separate, you know, any of the dishes with a design on them and then any of the dishes that don't have a design on them and then look at them completely differently and and maybe never consider them all together again. Um, uh, this could this this seems a little silly if you approach it that way. So there are good reasons uh, because you know they do offer different kinds of information. So I'm not saying that this practice is bad and wrong, but it does have uh, have some consequences for uh, how things are documented, how things are observed, how things are reported, and uh, when we're working then from archival work or um, using old collections using old data sets, um, it, has a, it has a lasting effect. Uh, and so like if you're interested like me in the sort of holistic picture of what a ceramic assemblage looks like, uh, it can be pretty challenging to put it back together uh, after, after the fact. Um, but there were 14 different Salado polychrome vessels that were studied as part of that Pueblo Grande whole vessel study. Uh, no profile drawings were made of those vessels. The jars were too incomplete to get a whole profile, and the archival photographs of the bowls um, are tilted to show the uh, the painted designs on the interior rather than to show the uh, the vessel shape. So uh, the archival data just really don't give us the information that we would need to be able to include them in this analysis. Um, 11 of those 14 vessels were recorded as having incurved rims, uh, but without the actual shape data, we're just kind of left with guesstimation as to where those would fall in our plot. Um, so without polychrome data from Las Colinas or Pueblo Grande, we have to reach for data from another uh, Phoenix Basin site, and that is the site of Los Muertos. Uh, so for Los Muertos, I do have currently a small sample of 10 polychrome whole vessel profiles. And they are the ones in deep blue or purple, however that shows up on your screen. So though this is a small sample, you can see that the bowls from Los Muertos sit pretty neatly along the range uh, occupied by bowls in other Hocom wares and types. So this suggests that while the paint and decoration on the Salado polychromes would have been something new uh, in the area, these vessels would have had shapes that were familiar and common to other types of pottery that people were using. Now, when we shift and look at the jars, the polychrome jars don't fall outside the range of other Hohokam jars, but they do tend toward a certain range of shapes that is different from a lot of other Hohokam jar forms. Um, and though this is a very small sample at the moment, um, we also see a pretty strong separation in between the bowl shapes and the jar shapes. We don't have uh, a lot of examples falling in that kind of ambiguous middle space. Um, it will be interesting with the addition of more samples to see how this picture develops. Um, but there, there you go, you have some polychromes. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, walk through uh, different ways of exploring um, these vessel forms. As far as understanding Hohokam ceramic assemblages, I think we see that there's far more continuity in vessel shape variation than the usual categories that we use to record and communicate about these would suggest. Uh, it's quite difficult looking at those categories, reading those categories, looking at tables to get a sense of what that underlying data look like. Um, so the vessel shape analysis using, using EFA, using plots like this, really helps us to see that 
uh, continuous variation helps us see that ambiguity a lot more clearly. Uh, and that's something that I find really exciting and interesting. So I'm um, I'm excited to take that uh, pattern in mind as I read and think further about these uh, ceramic assemblages. And then when we think about the place of Salado polychromes in Phoenix Basin and ceramic assemblages, uh, we see that those bowls tend to appear in a range of shapes that are that would be familiar. They're not radically different from other bowl shapes that appear in Hocom ceramic assemblages. And the jars, the polychrome jars, tend toward a typical range of shapes that if you've looked at examples of Salado polychrome jars from around the Southwest, really not just the Phoenix Basin, they sort of tend toward a typical range of shapes. Um, so they're kind of similar to each other and they might be similar only to a subset of other Hocom jars. Um, but they're quite different from, uh, from lots of kinds of Hoacom jar shapes. Uh, and this, uh, going back to the sort of, you know, twofold goals I had here, um, I hope this also helps us to recognize how some of our very standard, you know, developed for very good reasons, uh, ordinary habitual ways of doing things, how we look at things, how we study them, record them, um, can have both intended and unintended consequences and kind of shape um, possibilities for uh, understanding the material record and understanding the past. So I want to talk a little bit about future work. Of course, I want to expand the data set. This is uh, just a small portion of what I'm hoping to do just with the, the vessel shapes. Um, and what's really exciting to me about this kind of analysis is, well, so many things. When I look at these plots and when I think about this, I just have questions, questions, questions coming up. What about this? What about that? Can I look at this? Um, so I want to explore the other variables, like how does shape relate to the wear? How does it relate to the type? How does it relate to the temper type and the provenance? Um, how do these things change through time? Uh, a lot of this is, uh, you know, we set our hopes high and the it's it's entirely dependent on the availability and the quality of data. So some of these questions I, I won't be able to answer satisfactorily, but I'm still going to think about it and get really excited. Um, and I also think that uh, this, this structure that I'm seeing, this sort of um, continuous variation in Hocom ceramic vessel forms, I think this structure and the things that are interesting about it are going to really um, pop out when the Hocom assemblages are compared with other examples of ceramic assemblages from outside the Phoenix Basin just on a on a gut sense from having worked in other places um, and, and looked at the literature, uh, ceramic assemblages and the sort of range of variability within particular types and forms is just really different in different regions. And I think this is a, an interesting way to document and represent and explore uh, those patterns and relationships. Uh, and then, of course, more future work is the rest of my dissertation, which kind of goes back uh, right to the beginning uh, and talking kind of big big picture questions about Salado and the Phoenix Basin. So um, this shape work is is one component and is sort of focused on the um, the user side aspect. So the, this pot is a thing in your hands that you use. It's, it's not necessarily a potter focused uh, part of the question. Um, but the other parts, technological compositional analyses that I'm pursuing um, are a little more related to the um, the potter's perspective on things, how, um, you know, what uh, raw materials are being used, how they're being prepared, how the pots are being formed, um, where they're being made, things like that. Um, so that's coming. Stay tuned. Um, but uh, for now, I will just thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, people who helped me get access to data sets um, and talk about ideas, especially Dave Abbott, Arthur Vokes, who was at ASM, 
uh, Lindsay Vogel Teeter at Pueblo Grande and um, volunteers at Pueblo Grande Museum who made archival profiles and analysis records available, including during the middle of the pandemic uh, remotely uh, so that I could work on them while I was far away. Uh, and I also want to thank all of the research apprenticeship students who put in uh, hours of fantastic work alongside me uh, to help make this happen. It's uh, so valuable to have their contributions. Uh, thank you to Jeff Mandel for experimentation and technical troubleshooting. And thank you to the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society for the invitation to share this research. Thank you. All right, um, Caitlin, do you want to leave your presentation up or and you might want to refer back to it. It's up to you. I might. I'll just go okay. back to the. Um, maybe I won't. <laughs> it doesn't want to let me go back. I'm glad I didn't have to do that. In the <laughs> I guess we're going to sit here. I'm just going to be thankful tonight. OK, you can, you can stop your screen share then. OK, and then, then we can see you better. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, we do have questions already, so let's just oh get started. And those of you who haven't put them in yet, go ahead and put them in. We'll have we'll have time to answer a few more for sure. All right. Um, the first, I noticed that most of the vessel forms have curved bottoms. And this is a person asking, how were they supported and how did they stay level that way? Yeah. Um... Well, I want to start by saying that a curved base on a clay vessel can be a really helpful thing. I think today when we live and move around tables and chairs and flat uh, pavement and floors, uh, a flat surface seems like what we would want. Um, but in ceramic vessels, uh, either concave or convex surface can help to distribute the sort of stresses in the body and you can have uh it's less likely to crack in some cases um so even though to us in our our context that might seem a little awkward um it can be a very uh beneficial thing for the life of your pot um so if you have uh if you have dirt floors this is not a problem you know make a little divot another uh thing that sometimes happens you you can have make little wreath shaped or little donut uh, pot stands out of various materials, fabric or uh, woven uh, woven materials, um, or uh, balancing them on like a, like three rocks is another way to deal with that. So there are a number of different solutions for keeping a round bottomed pot upright and stable on any number of surfaces or over a fire. Okay. Um, I noticed that most of the vessel, oh, sorry, same one. In the Pueblo Grande Morpho space, does the shape characterization remove vessel size? Yes. And yes. if that were added in, would that allow you to separate the traditional form classes more clearly? That is a really good question. Uh, and it's something that I'm interested in. Uh, this analysis right now is the uh, like least common denominator analysis across all of the different vessels that I can get uh, access to, to profiles of or images of profiles. Uh, and a lot of those don't have any size data attached to them. Uh, but the ones for the Pueblo Grande set do have metric information attached. And that is something um, that I could go back in and attach that information to these and and see what impact that would have. I think that is definitely something that would be good to explore, but uh, haven't done it yet. Oops. Sorry. Um, OK, um, this is a little different focus. What programs and systems for GMM are you using, and where and how did you learn to do EFA analysis? <sighs> Okay, it's the nerdy bit. Um, I am doing that work in uh, in R, uh, using a package called Momox. And uh, where did I learn about this? Um, 
I'll give a shout out to my colleague, Robert Bischoff, who's been also working on geometric morphometric work uh, and using EFA. Uh, I got interested in profiles and shapes and was um, really investigating different ways to uh, look at, document, measure, compare, explore relationships among these things. And there are a number of different methods out there. There are um, also landmark based things that are a bit fiddly to use, in my opinion, with ceramics, because we don't have um, consistent landmarks. Uh, they, they can be hard to place consistently and reliably. Um, so I really liked the um, ability of EFA to uh, capture that whole shape. Uh, but yes, doing this in R, using the Momox package, and uh, yeah, being inspired by the literature and my colleagues. Great. Uh, okay. Um, how, or sorry, are your 14 examples, all of the Salado polychrome vessels from Los Muertos, all of the examples at the Harvard Peabody Museum, or have those been re repatriated also? I don't actually know the status of those particular vessels. The profiles that I was working with are just um, from published images in Howry's report. So the images that were published that that are actually true profiles and not super tipped and tilted, which is also why there are so few of them. Um, OK, and are you looking only at the Phoenix Basin or at other portions of the Salado world, too? The Mills collection of whole vessels in the Safford area might be useful, and Pat Lyons and other desert ar archaeology alumni have done a lot of whole vessel work. Another non-dissertation area of research. I would I would love to do a big um, yeah. I would I would love to look at the whole region and all of Salado. Um, but not right now. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting thing. Through the dissertation, I'm really focusing on the Phoenix Basin. Uh, and with the collections I've been able to access here, it's uh, not as much as the Phoenix Basin as I had originally hoped, but uh, pretty centered on the Lower Salt River Valley. But um, yeah, that other work is very interesting to me. I will be paying attention to that for sure. All right, uh, since the majority of Salado polychrome pots seem to be bowls, which would indicate functional everyday use? How did the internal polychrome decoration hold up? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Not having been able to actually examine any of these um, whole vessel uh, examples, right? Because all, all I got to see was the, the profile from these vessels. Uh, looking at shirt collections, it's pretty variable. Um, some of them are very worn, and it's not clear to me what the cause of that might be. It could be the quality of the slip and how well the slip adhered to the body clay. It could be the nature of what was put in there, if it might have been something acidic that would eat away at uh, the surface. Uh, Sometimes it's just, you know, after it's been sitting out somewhere for a couple hundred years, it's just been weathered. Um, so when you when I see these in or, you know, or scraped with a scoop or something like that, um, there is there is use wear on these things. And it's it's variable how well that interior uh, design holds up. But in general, it's there, I would say, in most of the shirts that I've looked at, the vast majority of them, the interior designs are still there. So there's a related question to the decoration piece. Is there enough archival data to add that those, any decorative characteristics to the shape analysis? Mm, probably. Um, I'm racking my brain about that, um, about that data set. There, there might be, there might be. <laughs> I think that's as far as I can get with that one, sorry. That's okay. 
All right, um, we just have one more. If there are any others, go ahead and put them in. I'm seeing a few more show up, so let's see. Um, uh, let's see, what would you expect to see if you were able to expand the top of topological analysis of vessel form to three dimensions instead of a single profile? Ooh, mm. that would also be cool. Um, that would for sure help to differentiate the scoop and bowl uh, overlap. Um, scoops tend to have, if you were looking down straight from the top down on them, they often have sort of a teardrop or an oblong egg shape, uh, whereas bowls are typically round, circular in, in a plan view, uh, but sometimes they're ovals that exist. And, and in fact, one of the vessels from the Pueblo Grande Hole Vessel Study, one of the polychromes is an oval, uh, oval-shaped bowl. Uh, in the, let's see, I guess with the, with the handled vessels too, I'm, I'm presuming, I'm guessing that I have like a really fancy 3D scanner and access to these original objects and we could get scans of them, right? If this is the hypothetical. Um, you could also have a lot closer look at, at the jugs and pitchers. Um, the, right now they're in there and it's just the maximal outline. So, because uh, this shape <laughs> is considered different from this shape uh, by the EFA. So if you have a digitized profile of, of a jug with a handle and that handle's not facing the same way, it's going to be interpreted as two different shapes. So in this analysis, we went through and flipped all of them. So all of the handles on all of the asymmetrical things. So all of the scoops and all of the jugs, all the handles are to the right. I apologize to any left-handers out there, but we had to pick something and we picked right. Um, uh, and it, they also, the jugs also look weird because uh, the EFA is tracing the maximum outline. So it's it's a blobby shape with like an ear coming off of it. And it's just a solid. So you don't see the loop um, in the handle where your fingers would go if you grasped it. Uh, so 3D scanning would would definitely allow us to look at variability in that range, which would be pretty cool. Uh, for other kinds of bowls, jars, and the incurved rim, recurved rim things that are sort of symmetrical and you'd expect them to be symmetrical kind of in any rotation around that's you know a little axis there. Uh, I don't know how much that would tell us extra um, beyond the two dimensions, but that's an interesting idea to think about. All right. Um, you mentioned that only up to 2% of the assemblage in the Phoenix Basin is Salado. I assume you're referring to the decorated, not the undecorated collection? What is that? Well, during the the decorated assemblage is quite small. So actually the whole the whole assemblage. Um uh, yeah, during the late classic period, we don't have the same uh, prevalence of uh, red on buff wares, as you see in the Hohokam pre-classic, a lot, a lot of what is being made and used is plain wares and red wares. And then there's a little bit of decorated stuff of any kind. Um, yeah, we just, it's quite different from uh, other parts of the Southwest where I worked. All right. Um, I think you. I think you talked about the fact that the pottery in the mortuary context um, was not necessarily created for that purpose. But this question is related to that. Were there were these cremations or inhumations where you where these pots were found? The both. Um, and I don't have off the top of my head how many came from what kind of mortuary feature, but definitely both cremation and uh, burial features were. Uh, part of those excavations. Okay. And are you looking at private sector reports as well for these sites? Uh, private sector re reports. I'm not quite certain what that is, what that would refer to. Um, I'm happy to look at whatever I can get my hands on. So if you know of something that I should look at, please send me an email <laughs> and let me know. Um, Cause I, I would like to look at everything. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to that person, if if you, uh, you will receive a follow up email after this lecture that gives my 
email address, the ARC and HIS email address, and we will forward any questions or comments or other additional information you'd like to share with Caitlin. So um, you'll get that email address in the follow-up um, email that you get from us. Um, okay, so here's a little clarification. Uh, CRM firm reports for more recent excavations within the state. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 So are you looking at those? And you will look at those. Yeah, I'm trying eventually. to look very, <laughs> very broadly <laughs> at everything. So thank okay. you for the clarification. Yeah. All right, great. Um, okay, I think that's it. I have one more question. When do you plan to complete this dissertation? <laughs> oh, that's mean. Um, <laughs> I I am undertaking a terrifyingly fast ride. Um, I'm hoping to finish in the spring, at the end of spring 2023, like right. the end of this academic year. Um, yeah, so wish me luck. <laughs> yes, good luck. And, I'm terrified. And, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure folks are looking for, um, you know, you have a lot that you're still working on and it, it's going to be awesome to see where it goes. I, but yeah. I hope so. I'm excited um, for it. And so I had another, just a comment. Um, oh, wait, there's one more. Uh, there's one more question. Could you share how you handled vessel data while you were extracting it from the archival sources? Did you use Excel or something more robust than that? Uh, extracting the data Extract mm -hmm. from the yeah. archival sources. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about how to answer that question because um, the process is a little funny. I received either scans or photocopies or we made scans of images to digitize. Um, we have been using, because we have a, a team of me and students who've been working remotely and collaboratively on this, we've used Google Sheets because we can work at the same time um, to create kind of tracking sheets for uh, metadata for each vessel profile and also figure out, you know, who's digitizing what and have they finished it and they have they uploaded it to the Dropbox um, so that I can download it and include it in the analysis. What happens when we have the um, the shapes digitized is then, and we were using Inkscape to do that, that digitizing, Inkscape wants to export a PNG and then we use, what did we use, Image Magic to do a PNG to JPEG conversion because the uh, the package in R that, that runs this EFA, it wants to read a JPEG that's just a, a high contrast silhouette. It wants to see a white shape on a black background or, or vice versa. Um, and then it is kind of doing a lot of that stuff on the fly. So that information is, uh, it's not something that that's spit out in a table that I then um, have to manage a, a big spreadsheet or a database of, of numbers for. Uh, you, it, it takes like, what, four and a half seconds, I think, to run it for all the Pueblo Grande uh, profiles. And then I can run a principal components analysis on that output from the from the EFA, and that's what generates the plots that I showed today. Um, so that's how I did it, and I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Great. All right, I think that's it for questions. I have one comment that says this presenta presentation was brilliant. Thanks, and it's an anonymous comment. So, um, but thank you very much um, for for spending your time with us. We know how busy this part of your life is with with working on this dissertation and all the data. But thank you, Caitlin. And for those of you out there, again, if you have questions, the ARC and HIS email address will be in the follow up email you get, and you're welcome to submit them to us and I'll pass on to Caitlin anything that she needs to answer. So thank you very much everyone and have a good evening and we'll see you again next month or for those three activities that we're doing in October. So thanks Caitlin, good night. Great. Thank you, good night.